Welcome to this virtual workshop, Build Back Better Cities with GeoBIM Technologies. Now, with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, discussions arose if the pandemic might be pushing folks out of the cities. Contrary to this, according to the UN, about 60% of the global population will be in cities by 2030. The city's infrastructure is already under a lot of stress. And the recent pandemic has further challenged the health and financial systems. Simultaneously, the high occurrences of calamities associated with climate change and the exposure of urban cities to disasters are necessitating governments and communities all over the world to rethink their long-term strategies. Sustainable Development Goal number 9 emphasizes building resilient infrastructure to provide sustainable industrialization and foster innovation, brackets close. Resilient and sustainable infrastructure is the key to meeting the future generation's requirements and rebuild the aging infrastructure exposed to global risks and natural catastrophes. Well, in the summer of 2020, the United Nations Global Geospatial Information Management, together with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations and the World Geospatial Industry Council, published a joint white paper. It highlights the value of integrated geospatial and BIM solutions for resilient infrastructure. Now, WGIC welcomes you to a virtual workshop right now that discusses this and more joint work by the UN GGIM, WFEO and WGIC. We will focus on the need for resilient infrastructure for cities and building and rebuilding better cities with GeoBIM technologies. Well, let me roll you through the agenda now. First uh, 40 minute session, uh, we'll have separate topics and speakers um, and it will start off with a recorded um, presentation by Marlene Kanga. She's the past president of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. And then we will go into the integrated geospatial information framework for resilient cities and infrastructures. That's the IGIS. Um, uh, speaker will be Chi Hai Tio, UN Secretariat, Global Geospatial Information Management. So he's with the UN. And next, uh, coming up in this line, is Ananya Narain, uh, Deputy Director, AEC and Market and Economy, uh, Economy of Geospatial Media. She will uh, present you some of the case studies in resilient cities. Now, the second bit of this workshop will consist of a panel discussion. Um, uh, we will present Benoit Frederic of Bentley Systems and Frank Wise of Oracle. So without further ado, let's go back to the first one I mentioned, which is the recorded presentation of Marlene Kanga, um, past president of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. She will talk about the collaboration between WFEO, UNGGIM and WGIC. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to join you today on this very important panel discussion on the implementation of geospatial technologies and building information modeling for smarter cities. I'm pleased to be here to represent the World Federation of Engineering Organizations as its immediate past president. The World Federation of Engineering Organizations is the peak body for engineering organizations globally. We have members in some 100 nations representing more than 30 million engineers. I'm very pleased that the World Geospatial Information Council is an important associate of the Federation. A key objective of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations is to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals through engineering. This vision and narrative was developed during my term as president of the Federation. And it also has developed an imperative to build capacity to understand how technology and advanced engineering can be used for sustainable development. And of course, the use of geospatial engineering and advanced building information modeling meets this objective as well. We need to build capacity 
for the implementation of these technologies. It is for this reason that the World Federation of Engineering Organizations and the World Geospatial Information Council came together in 2019 during my term as president for a collaborative project to demonstrate how such technologies can be implemented. We are very pleased that we were joined also by the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management. The re project resulted in a white paper that was launched at the United Nations High Level Political Forum in July 2020. The white paper brought together experts and leaders from around the world and demonstrates the importance of geospatial information. It builds capacity by demonstrating case studies of successful implementation of these technologies around the world. It identifies critical challenges to implementation and it recommends approaches on addressing these through the framework established by the United Nations Committee of Experts, Global Geospatial Information Management. So why cities? In 2019, the United Nations launched the Global Sustainable Development Report on progress in sustainable development. And it identified science and engineering as one of the four levers to accelerate sustainable development. And it also identified urban and peri-urban environments, in other words, cities, as one of the six pathways that can accelerate transformation or sustainable development. So here we have the framework and urban and peri-urban environments, and we have the lever of science and technology. And at that confluence, we have, of course, smart cities. So this demonstrates the importance of this topic of building back better, smarter cities for sustainable development. And why sustainable cities? Sustainable cities are central to achieving all the 17 sustainable development goals. Because by 2050, cities will have approximately 70% of the world's population and produce 85% of the world's economic output. And of course, your urban development needs to be well-planned, integrated and inclusive and access advanced technologies for cities. Sustainable cities should prioritize access to jobs and affordable housing, healthcare, education, sustainable transport, and attractive public spaces for all. Sustainable cities should promote sustainable consumption and production and consider environmental impacts and resilience to natural disaster. Each one of these objectives incorporates one of the or more of the sustainable development goals. And of course, sustainable and livable cities have a close connection between people and nature to enhance human health, well-being, protect biodiversity, and strengthen climate change resilience. Geospatial information, of course, brings together digital information about a place. It reflects the physical world in a digital version. It brings together not only physical location data, but other associated data and presents this in various layers, maps, satellite imagery, aerial photography, etc., are brought together. And this information enables city governments and administrators to plan a better city because it can incorporate land administration and property ownership data, urban planning and land use information, transport networks and hubs, health infrastructure, education facilities, the location of water networks and facilities, nature reserves and parks, natural disaster prone areas. And it can also incorporate population and income data for the planning of the future of the city. And most importantly, the digital infrastructure, telecommunications, mobile and broadband. And all this data also en enables social and economic policies such as smarter transportation and energy use, better environmental management and waste management, information for citizens and their engagement, investigation of crimes, health and education, recreation and affordable housing. 
Building information modeling also enables a digital twin, but of a construction project, such as office building, hospital, sports stadium, school, university, airport, railway station, or a precinct within a city, and enables all this information to be brought together in a digital format so that architects, engineers, and construction professionals can plan, design, construct, and manage these buildings during construction and in the future. It enables different options to be considered at the design stage and optimization on energy use, materials, and also better operations and efficiency. During construction, it facilitates collaboration and communication between the various teams, reducing costly mistakes, sometimes even before you get onto the construction site. And so building information modeling very much enables cities to build back better. I present here a case study from the white paper that was released in July on the use of geospatial information in the city of Lisbon, Portugal, for drainage management and flood mitigation. Geospatial data includes terrain information, mapping of water, sewerage, and stormwater networks, real-time sensor information, video surveillance, and public reporting. This has enabled the modeling of the city's water and stormwater networks and predictive analysis on capacity limitations and flooded events. It has enabled the development of appropriate planning for infrastructure to increase capacity and facilitate emergency response. This has greatly reduced events that resulted in significant inundation and this is increasingly important as sea level rise increases with climate change impacts. And here I have the digital twin of my home city of Sydney, Australia. This digital twin is set to transform urban planning and design using spatial data of the built environment today and tomorrow. It can be readily accessed real time in the link that I have shown here. The, the data integrates real-time transport data, information on above and below ground utilities, electricity, gas, water, and broadband, building information, property data, health and education facility, information on trees and the canopy cover, roads and buildings. And so this comprehensive data is expected to enable the city government to build back a better city. And of course, we cannot leave this presentation without talking about COVID-19 in this most extraordinary year. And here we have real-time information uh, from uh, ESRI, which again shows the spread of the COVID-19 virus globally uh, in real time. This data was captured on the 27th of November, just one week ago. Such data is being used by governments to track the spread of COVID-19, not just in cities, but across the country. It captures data using various sources, including credit card transactions, mobile phone locations, to track and trace locations of confirmed cases. It enables policymakers to implement travel bans and lockdown policies. And medical services, such as hospitals, can be supported based on location and trends in cases. So you can see that geospatial information technologies and building information modeling are crucial for building back better and sustainable cities because they enable better services for people. They enable better work and economic growth. They enable innovation, especially in the provision of critical water and electricity services. They enable responsible consumption and resilience against climate change, and they enable stronger and better institutions, especially local and city governments, in planning better cities. So this de demonstrates the importance of geospatial information technologies and building information technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, on we go with Chi Hai Tio. He is the UN Secretariat Global Geospatial Information Management. That's the UNGGIM. 
He's going to talk to you about integrated geospatial information framework for resilient cities and infrastructures. So that's the integrated geospatial information framework. Some uh, might know this as the IGR. Well, I hope he's ready now for it. Chi Hai Tio, the floor is yours. Thank well, you. Thank you. I believe you will be able to see my uh, presentation on the screen and my thanks to the organizers for putting together this event. I also wish to acknowledge our partners, WFEO and WGIC, who are working with us to address the challenges of a data ecosystem for resilient and sustainable cities and infrastructure. The United Nations Integrated Geospatial Information Framework, the IGIF, provides a new paradigm and a mechanism for strengthening national geospatial information management uh, arrangements in countries for the well-being of people, planet, and prosperity. The IGIF focuses on integrated geospatial information to relate people to place, activities, and events and reimagining the data ecosystem for sustainable and resilient cities and its infrastructures. For the benefit of some, the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management is the peak intergovernmental body comprising of experts from all member states of the United Nations, as well as experts from international organizations as observers. The committee meets annually and reports to the United Nations uh, Economic and Social Council. An objective and function of the committee is to provide a forum for coordination and dialogue among member states and between member states and relevant international organizations. In 2017, the committee convened the Kunming Forum that addressed cities of the future, smart, resilient, and sustainable. Over 160 experts from 30 countries met and shared experiences and knowledge, explored and emphasized the role and contribution of geospatial information in shaping and building smart, resilient and sustainable cities of the future. The Kunming Forum observed that cities of the future will be integrative data ecosystems generating and consuming massive amounts of data and in real time to relate people to their place, their activities and to incidences and events. This data ecosystem will generate and consume multi-dimensional data, including soon to be built and, and the built environment. The demand and needs are for quality, reliable and timely data to inform good policy and decisions in urban context. Concerted and collaborative efforts are needed to bring together and integrate data and information from multiple sources with differing scales and temporality, leveraging geospatial information management as a technological and critical enabler. The Secretariat agreed to collaborate with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations and the World Geospatial Industry Council to address the adoption of integrated geospatial information and building information modeling solutions for the SDGs. This is in response to the outcomes of the Kunming Forum to play an increasing and proactive role in shaping and building smarter, more resilient and sustainable cities and infrastructures. The collaboration, as you have heard, resulted in a white paper that provides an overview and assessment of the geospatial and beam technology landscape with specific focus on resilient infrastructures. It also addresses challenges in the adoption of integrated geospatial and beam solutions. The paper contributes directly towards ensuring progress towards safe, smart, inclusive and resilient infrastructure and cities. In this regard, the United Nations Integrated Geospatial Information Framework provides a basis and a mechanism to realize the desired data ecosystem for smart, resilient, and sustainable cities and infrastructures.
The IGIF with its three key pillars or influences, governance, technology and people, translate high-level strategic concepts into practical implementation guidance and action for use by member states and cities. The framework provides a reference and a mechanism for developing, strengthening, and coordinating geospatial information management arrangements nationally, and for articulating and demonstrating national leadership, cultivating champions, and developing the capacity to take positive actions. The framework is a key umbrella for the many globally agreed frameworks, strategies, approaches, and activities developed and adopted by the United Nations Committee of Experts, which can be implemented by any country to guide transformational change. This includes collaborative, collaborative efforts to bring together and to integrate data and information from multiple sources collected for a variety of purposes for smart data-driven approaches needed for resilient cities and infrastructures. IGIF focuses on geospatial information that is integrated with any other meaningful data, including building information to address societal and environmental challenges. It acts as a catalyst for economic growth and opportunity and to provide better and more useful information, knowledge, and insights leading to shared understanding. In turn, this will enable us to better benefit from a country's development priorities and achieve the SDGs. The strategic pathways are presented as separate pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in recognition that there are many aspects and dimensions to each individual pathway. And that when joined together, the framework is implemented, the desired integration achieved. Crucially, the framework with its three key pillars or influences and the nine strategic pathways provide the mechanism for articulating and demonstrating leadership and the capacity to take positive steps. With that, I thank you. Thank you. Now, with that jigsaw puzzle, we can easily place ourselves in, in, in that frame and uh, see what we can actually do ourselves when we want to innovate, when we want to integrate data, or when we want to new, put new technologies into place within our own uh, organizations doing construction and building. It's, it's very, very nice to see that the United Nations have uh, actually uh, built up a, a workable framework that um, it's, it's not too complex for people outside looking in and at the same time where the specialists and technicians can also recognize their place. So uh, yeah, very nice to, to, to have this one in. I should be going back to my program and announce the next um, presentation, which is going to be Ananya Narain of Geospatial Media and Communications. She's going to uh, present some of the uh, practical practicalities, the case studies in resilient cities as found in the recent joint white paper that we have been talking about in this session. So Ananya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renko. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good, good evening to everybody who is joining in today. Uh, I'm Ananya Narayan, Deputy Director for AEC and Marketing and Economy, Geospatial Media and Communications. Uh, as Demko mentioned, and as all other panelists have also mentioned, uh, that uh, WGIC, Wolf, uh, WFAO and UNGGIM work together on a paper titled The Value of Integrated geospatial and BIM solutions to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals with a specific focus on resilient infrastructure. I had the opportunity to lead the preparation of this report as the head of the AEC working group for WGIC that year. So uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be presenting a brief uh, introduction to the report. And of course, you can access the report on the WGIC and the WFEO websites. So getting into, um, this is something that Professor Gonke covered yesterday also in his uh, keynote address, and I'm just uh, reiterating the definition. Uh, resi resilient infrastructure is the ability of an asset to resist, absorb, accommodate, and recover from the disturbances caused by a natural force or a hazard in a timely and efficient manner. And this 
includes the preservation and restoration of its basic uh, essential structures and functions. Especially in uh, today's time when we are going through uh, COVID and with earthquakes and hurricanes happening all across the globe, resilient infrastructure has become very critical today. So in 2015, uh, as we all know, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals came in and uh, the, sus the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, in its own way, they focus a lot on resilient infrastructure. For building resilient and sustainable com communities today, the, S the three S SDGs goals that the report also finds crucial are uh, the goal nine, which is uh, industry, innovation and infrastructure, which focuses on developing sustainable, resilient and inclusive infrastructures, promotes inclusive and sustainable industrialization, supports domestic technology development and industrial diversification, and also emphasizes on uh, universal access to information and communication technology. The second goal that is very relevant to the topic today, which is building better societies, is goal 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. This particular goal focuses on uh, the uh, development of safe and affordable housing, affordable and uh, su sustainable transport systems, inclusive and sustainable urbanization, and also supporting the least developed countries in sustainable and resilient buildings. The last goal, which uh, in today's time and where, which I think all of us are talking about is the goal 13, which is climate action. So climate action focuses on uh, strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters in all countries and build knowledge and capacity to meet the climate related challenges. So all these three goals together and the other goals are integrated in a manner to balance the social, economic and environmental sustainability, which is key to resilient infrastructure. So why is the infrastructure resiliency important? I, I, I don't think I can stress on this enough that uh, the infrastructure assets that we see today, uh, power, water, transport, telecommunications, they all are uh, somehow or the other are affected by natural shocks and the dense urban clusters. So in this regard, uh, what we are seeing is a direct damage to power generation and transport infrastructure worth uh, 18 billion US dollars, to household and firms worth about 300 billion US dollars, and to people and welfare of households to about uh, 90 billion uh, US dollars. This, this, is, this is a very significant amount. And when we get on to a, a, a next a uh, picture of uh, how much does investment in resilient infrastructure, the benefit that it brings, it is about 4.2 trillion US dollars. So, uh, so countries and organizations, everybody, all of us together need to invest in resilient infrastructure because the benefit of it is much, much, much more. And it is, a, it is much needed today. So a couple of uh, key, uh, key aspects of uh, building resilient infrastructure is uh, what we are seeing, at least in the most uh, in the developing countries, is that uh, the, the focus is on maintaining, uh, is on building more infrastructure and not maintaining it. So the focus needs to shift from just uh, not building more, but maintaining more. Then the second is to promote flexible development of new services to redevelop, to redevelop the existing infrastructure. And uh, one of the most important is to assess and prioritize risks according to the level of pro probability and severity. The fourth one is adapt existing infrastructure to the consequences of climate change and the associated increase in extreme weather events. So taking all these factors into consideration uh, as listed on the slide as well, it is important for all of us to focus on resilient infrastructure. But we cannot do it without technology. Given the way the technology is transforming, the two technologies that are important in this case is uh, one is, of course, GeoBIM solutions. And I think uh, that is what we are trying to discuss today is uh, GeoBIM solutions are a prerequisite today for building complex, connected, resilient and sustainable infrastructure. The confluence of uh, geospatial data and information and the BIM models together provides for a better geospatial context and 3D context, a better design and coordination to maximize the long-term value and solve the sustainability and resiliency issues. The other thing 
which again we are discussing today is the construction 4.0 technologies so 4 ir technologies as we normally call it is the bedrock of the hyper connected uh, epoch establishing a path breaking force uh, to ensure sustainable and resilient infrastructure the technologies that we have today iot sensors uh, augmented reality uh, 3d printing all of these uh, solutions together are critical to steer the uh, resiliency in infrastructure projects so going forward and i don't need uh, if i can have the next slide please so going forward i don't think uh, i need to get into the detail of what are the benefits of uh, gis or satellite remote sensing or lidar or bim or gnss and positioning systems all of these technologies together they enable uh, monitoring and visualization of critical infrastructure they provide real time update uh, and collaboration with project team they help to capture location di discover patterns generate hypothesis of affected infrastructure improve mapping of risks and priority areas and finally they help to accurately locate the project design and reorient infrastructure models which are critical for developing the uh, resiliency in infrastructure more infrastructure projects for tomorrow if we are talking about the case studies one of the most important case studies that is very close to where i stay in uh, if is of uh, the ne nepal earthquake so in april 2015 and i'm sure all of us are aware uh, the gorkha earthquake kill killed approximately 9000 people and injured more than 20000 people after that one of the major challenges which was uh, which was faced by the city was to restore its cities to its original glory and ensure that the development of resilient infrastructure happens that whatever new uh housing or new schools that have uh, that that are built are resilient enough uh to survive an earthquake like that and to reduce the number of deaths injuries and economic losses uh that 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 happen so in order to meet its goal geospatial solutions primarily lidar and satellite based remote sensing solutions along with bim solutions uh were were actively used by by the organization uh, by an organization called build change uh, to improve structural structural workflows refine construction models and obtain insights into how buildings can be developed further and uh, how the quality can be improved in order to make uh, more resilient housing societies so uh, in this in this particular case study uh the organization build change uh, used uh, integrated geospatial and bim solutions to ensure uh, that technology provides them with uh, cap the capacity to develop better quality designs the second case study is that uh, of the lisbon uh, portugal uh, the lisbon uh, lisbon flood Re resilience case studies i think dr marlin has uh, covered the same in her presentation as well this is a very important uh, case study from the sustainable cities and communities point of view uh, but i won't get into uh, its detail J it's just that the uh, in this particular case study satellite uh, satellite based remote sensing solutions real time sensors gis and of course uh, bim were used to ensure that the planning was data driven and uh, preemptive steps could be taken in time in case a flood does happen lastly coming to the challenges uh, of why uh, geobim is still not being uh, adopted um, the i think we can very well agree the most common challenges that uh, there's a lack of technology awareness and knowledge that is a common uh, theme across from whatever i've heard in this conference and whatever i hear otherwise the second important thing is high cost of technology and disruptive implementation with the way innovation is uh, continuously happening in the geospatial and the bim sector it's 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 not easy for everyone to keep up with it so uh, that kind of uh, is a challenge for most of the stakeholders internal motivation i think these three internal motivation is one of the challenges which drives people so these three are the primary challenges which is why uh, organizations or countries or stakeholders are not able to adopt the geospatial and bim solutions and these needs to be these challenges need to be resolved to increase the adoption 
So uh, my last slide, which is the way, uh, which is the way forward, um, it focuses on the challenges that I just mentioned. Uh, governance and institutions and legal and policy integrated geobim solutions need to be incorporated if you want to develop the uh, next gen of resilient infrastructure as a policy guideline and with the way we are progressing towards digital uh, cities and smart technologies uh, we need to start mandating smart uh, technologies and open data sharing that is that is at the core uh, when it comes to data innovations and standards there need there needs to be layered plans and adaptation strategies to mitigate uh, any risks that, that that is foreseen when it comes to financials and uh, partnerships then there needs to be forward looking investment models which uh, uh, accelerate investment in green infrastructure and smart technologies for robust and flexible infrastructure systems and lastly partnerships like the partnership between wfeo wgic and ungim is very important in times like today to advocate people about uh, the role of technology and the impact that it can create on uh, on in the society today so i do strongly urge and feel that these recommendations need to be taken seriously for if we want to avoid the risks that we face today from natural forces and urban clusters uh, geospatial uh, technologies and its integration with bim is going to change how resilient and sustainable cities are going to be built tomorrow with this i end my presentation thank you well, we uh, we've just seen uh, some of the outlines and, and the concepts behind uh, uh, our, our plans and, and goals going forward to uh, building and rebuilding better cities with resilient technologies. Now, I would really like to uh, introduce some of the people who are actually facilitating this stuff. Um, one of them is Benoit Frederic. He's a director of product management and uh, reality modeling within Bentley Systems. And um, the other one I would like to introduce, I'm not sure if he's in yet. It's already there, Frank Weiss, are you there? Yes. He's, he is. Thank you so much. Frank is Senior Director, New Products, BIM and Innovation at Oracle. And, uh, and together we are going to try to give you a, uh, a sketch and an, and an overview of, of how it actually works. What, what is actually the role? What is actually the function of, of ICT and, and, and cloud structures, databases, and uh, uh, actual design software in order to get to the resilient infrastructures and the resilient buildings that we want? Um, let me go back to my notes now, because I'm not doing this all by heart. Um, I'll start off with uh, Bentley Systems. Bentley has a big strength in the infrastructure market overall. Oracle, tech apps, industry solutions, starts with an autonomous database and cloud services. We, we can all understand that Bentley and Oracle can be seen as complementary entities. Numerous organizations and cities use Bentley and or Oracle Spatial for editing, managing and storing geospatial information. And typically Oracle provides a database infrastructure where the data resides. The large constituencies of Oracle Spatial users together implement architecture, structured data in an open way and let me, let me now uh, frank uh, introduce frank wise to uh, uh, show his his position within oracle and his uh, stance on uh, tech apps and industry solutions frank it's yours okay thank you very much for the introduction remco so um, yeah it's a, it's a pleasure and honor being here at this very important conference and um, also, I'd like to understand on what role we as Oracle play here. So um, Oracle is pretty much known since 40 years as a, a database company, but also very active in the cloud infrastructure. So this is like, I'd say, um, data is our yeah, uh, bread and butter business um, since our founding. And uh, um, from this perspective, we have that special component, which is Oracle Spatial, where we also serve in the market since the very early beginning, where we also have been a founding member of the OGC for data st standardization in the GeoBIM space. Having said that, within Oracle, there are 10 GBUs. These are like global business units, uh, which are focusing on vertical markets. Um, one of them is the construction and engineering unit, 
um, over 2,500 experts um, out there globally acting. And there we are focusing on scheduling um, with the Primavera product, which is probably known in the market, uh, Textura as a financial um, tool, uh, with Aconex as a common data environment. And with those elements, we also serve for things which are related to data management, BIM-related topics, and uh, data science, which allows the insights which have been managed couple of times. And so these are like two big um, parts where we as an organization serve with core tech um, for many, many players and also in the vertical market with very market specific applications. There we also engage for standardization with building smart. Hence in the summary, um, before I hand over um, uh, to Benoit, we also uh, we believe that standardization is a key, why OGC engagement is key to us, is important to us, plus the building smart engagement where Richard Petrie has spoken in the morning, because data formats are um, ultimately um, a goal which we have to achieve to make an ecosystem working. So we go directly and mute it. I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm on. Um, I think we can directly go to Benoit and uh, have his... Uh, perspective from the Bentley side of uh, things. Benoit? So um, I'm part of Bentley system. Just before I'm, I'm joining about on Bentley, let me just take a moment to thank the previous speakers. I thought that I thought the really presentation were, were really great, um, very educating. And of course, lots of the aspect I shared the vision, but I could not have expressed that that well. So thank, thanks uh, for all. Um, those good contributions. So I'm part of Bentley system, as you mentioned earlier, Bentley is, a, is a, a key player in the software industry, uh, providing software for infrastructure to enable people to design, construct, operate infrastructure. Um, we have a component that actually touched the two pieces that has been discussed from a technology standpoint today, you know, the geospatial aspect uh, in the sense that we provide several product really with really uh, strong geo or geospatial uh, focus, but also the beam aspect. Bentley is very well known for its beam software for design, for construction, and for analysis of, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, Bentley is, is a company that was founded in 1984, if my memory is right, and um, and so we have been that that. Uh, I would say it's a business for, for a long time. Um, yeah, however, you know, we have contributed to several, I would say, evolution in the industry. And I think one of the aspects we, we witnessed these days is transition to go digital overall and the digital twin. That was very well discussed earlier, the importance of uh, making smarter city for better resiliencies. Uh, for uh, a lower impact on the environment, just for, I would say, better cities overall and better quality of life for the populations. And so that's a key, that's a key focus for Bentley really uh, to be part of that uh, digital twin journey and to empower, to support uh, professionals with the technology to embrace the digitalization process. Um, so we have been really investing lots of effort in, in that, with that vision in mind, making our technology more open and enabling a digital twin on the, um, I would say on the infrastructure. So if I refer back to several of the previous presentation, we are a key contributor of technologies here in that puzzle that we have seen earlier and we really aim at uh, contributing to build and rebuild better cities by providing software and technologies to enable um, digitalization and, and better infrastructure, particularly in cities. Um, one of several key aspects were already, already touched and such as the resilience and such as um, also the importance of getting all the information together for, for achieving that goal of smarter cities. And I think that's, that's a, the, I would say, the core uh, fundamental message I, um, I would like to uh, 
to stress here is that the essence for us is to get all that information together, relying on an openness, an openness approach with standardization of the data, but openness also on the technology to access the data and exchange um, data between systems, between platforms, so people are not you know, locked and, and can really leverage information. So this can fix you know, different aspects. It can be better technology for better engagement with citizens, giving them better visibility so they can contribute uh, to the design of their cities, or it can be at, I would say, more heavy engineering aspect where a practitioner, let's say a flood specialist, has ac access to all the information he needs to run his flood simulation and to assess potentially the impact of of, of an event on population. Uh, so yeah, I, kind of, I tried to connect a bit to the different components we've seen earlier to explain the alignment with our vision and our role as Bentley as contributor. So maybe Renko, do you want to jump on some of these aspects? And absolutely, and yeah. You both uh, were talking about the connections that you make with with your customers and also with uh, technology. So uh, I, I would like to uh, to hear from you both, starting with Frank. What it actually what it requires to be open to be able to connect. Frank, open over to you and openness. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think. You know, we have heard so many exciting topics in the context of smart city, geo BIM, the ecosystem of digital twins. And the question is, how can we really achieve that? Of course, everything starts with motivation. Um, that's an important part. But uh, in that motivation, I think it becomes clear that the, the, the digitization and digitalization is a key aspect to achieve that. So the ultimate question is, where does all this data resides? Where does it sit? Because when we speak about an ecosystem of digital twins or a smart city, it becomes clear that this is not about design, construction and operations, because it's about the maintenance of, an, of a system which stays yeah, kind of forever, because we have an ecosystem for transportation, for energy, for telecom, for water, and all of those components. In this context, um, I think we all agree that um, this is absolutely to the contemporary part of cloud infrastructure, where this data can sit. And in this context, data and data security is key. And I'd like to share an example for that. If we look at um, one or the other, remember the, the, the video which has been shared on Netflix about the social dilemma. And if, for instance, I access data from here in Germany through Google, or I do the same in the US or in Australia, I may, may get complete different results based on my algorithm. So that uh, based on the algorithm of the company, because I'm, I'm as a person, I'm the product. And it is very important when we think about smart cities and the ecosystem of digital twins, that the outcome of these results is not different. That has to be always the same. Hence, cloud infrastructure has to cope with um, uh, local, local qu uh, data quality requirements. That's very important. And it is important that what we get from this data as a feedback of the cyber physical connection is, is reliable. So this is one of the, the key aspects in the first place. Number two, um, this data has to sit on a proper platform. And we probably will see in the near future that these categories of platform providers, which are addressing requirements of a common data environment, like in accordance to the ISO 19650, are getting more and more traction and in parallel, we will have lots of powerful point solutions and services, call it microservices, which engage with these ecosystem in order to get the maximum and best outcome for, for the users, for, but also importantly for us as citizens living in these cities. So in order to achieve that, these platforms has to be open they have to have proper public APIs that this 
more or less can become a seamless integration and a seamless data flow. We clearly speak here about machine to machine uh, communication in that sense, which starts with the EIR, which are the exchange information requirements in the beginning of a project, measure that throughout the process, and then hand that over seamlessly for um, in commissioning uh, for operations and maintenance. And these are topics why we believe an engagement in OGC is important, that in the database structure, different vendors which are giving the best outcome to the users can be served. And in parallel, what we do in Building Smart when it's about IFC, like industry foundation classes, BS, uh, BCF, um, BIM uh, collaboration formats, and those elements that also the, the, the user can work with the best product possible. And these integrations, that's part of our vision where we believe as Oracle, we can contribute and can help the market to go under this transformation because it's nothing what one single entity can do by itself. Right. Thank you so much to one single entity. It should be interesting to note that uh, a building w will last longer than five years. A road uh, can be exist in existence for, for 2,000 years. And uh, uh, yeah, going back to, uh, to one, of, one of the older, more t with the tradition at least, uh, software systems like Bentley, uh, there's always the sense of, of legacy data as well. So not looking forward to maintenance and uh, 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 sustaining infrastructure, but also going back to the original design can be uh, a challenge. Uh, Benoit, can you can you uh, uh, sketch some of your customers' um, um, challenges with, with having to deal with uh, with long-lasting uh, infrastructure, long-lasting buildings, and your yeah. I think that that's a, a very good point that you are touching here. It's the notion of the temporality, right? And, and, and the two, two direction, backward and forward. And, uh, I think the, the openness of the data and at least the access of, of data, uh, of legacy data has been, uh, quite a strong commitment with Bentley and, and without going too much into detail, the, the DGN file format for engineering content has been, stable and, f and fixed and backward compatible for more than 15 years, I believe, something like that. Um, but maybe that's kind of, it's very important in practice because you can still access data that has 10, 15 years uh, uh, old these days. But um, I think beyond that also, it's, it stressed the importance of, of one point that was mentioned earlier by one of the speaker that uh, you know, sometimes people look at building and at the construction aspect only as a as a too much focused on the construction exercise itself and not enough thinking about the future of the maintenance and the operation of that given infrastructure. So if, if it, it is true in terms of, of data that you need to to keep and to keep open, but I think we can extend also the thinking um, to the kind of data we should gather as we design and you know, as we build, right? So the, if we keep in mind that the purpose of the process is not only to build the infrastructure, but, to, but also to operate it later on for the next 20 years, then we should think also about the role of BIM workflows and GIS workflows and technologies during those early stages. So we document properly the infrastructure to be used later on in the future, keeping in mind those key value that Frank mentioned of openness between platforms, right? Knowing that there is likely not a single unique platform to address all the needs, so a platform provider should show openness by embracing standard or, or open source and, and, and openness to access the information. Um, so yeah, I think the temporal aspect is key. So taking a practical example about a construction that is ongoing, documenting, for example, what is happening what was built in the trench during the construction um, stage, sorry, goes beyond serving the need of construction. It's already an exercise that allows documenting the underground infrastructure for future uh, operation when we won't be able to access those. 
and that kind of thing, us as geospatial specialists or rating modeling specialists or beam specialists have a role to take to educate uh, practitioners uh, and also maybe really to to share that opportunity with the decision maker that the effort they are making now documenting those uh, infrastructure will pay back later on. Right. Thank you. This this is on on the uh, uh, engineering side. This is on the design side of things where you have to be careful not to throw away valuable data and make sure that it's still valuable. But what, and, what and I think it's about the construction, you know, because it's not only about keeping the design data when it is when it's going to be operated. It's making sure that also there are always changing between what is constructed versus what was designed, right? So. Documenting the construction process itself and what is in practice built is also key. So, Frank, what, what about older standards? Will they be thrown away? Will they be nurtured or pushed? Uh, because we, we have a longer need for older stuff to be rejuvenated in, in, in further stages of, of, a, of a resilient and a longer lasting infrastructure. So, what, what happens? to the standards that we don't know that much about anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can see here in my background on the other side, probably an important painting, which is known by many people um, um, to avoid really Babylon. I think um, um, what I, I observe currently in, in standardization engagements where we at last are involved, is that the focus shifts a little bit. We have in the industry partly the phenomenon that we build standards before best practices. And I have um, reasons to believe that this is kind of changing through the agile paradigm. So that means that um, in Building Smart, in some of the engagements, we are putting together the the proper vendors and looking really on specific use cases, how things can be solved. And then to really try to deliver value out of those um, standards for the customer, yeah, and then build out the the, the standard to an a Zen, a Zen or an ISO or or the OCG OGC. Um, I think I'd like also to tackle an additional challenge because all, besides the standardization and the technology we should not forget um, the people, the people who have to use these applications. We have to take them on board onto the journey. And this is something what we do with our Oracle Lab approach, for instance, like in Chicago, where we really um, um, summon all of different type of vendors and technologies. Our technology, but also other vendors are invited, startups are invited, where customers and users can experience that. We have even asked our GC to use these applications and to bring value to the um, market and to uh, deliver um, according references. Thank you. Um, that answers the question. Yeah, it does. And it's very nice to end up with the actual users. And, and it, it's, strangely enough, we've already ran out of time we have discussed so little, and we thought we would be saying so much. But uh, I, I, th I think we've rounded up uh, a lot of practical stuff in addition to what was said before by the other speakers. I, I would like to really thank you all for listening, people. Really thank you for contributing to this workshop. And I, I feel there's a second volume coming up very soon because the last word has not been said about this. This is early stages. So thank you so much. And, and let's do this again very soon. Thank you again. <laughs>